Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of We Need to Talk About Dot 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 of the year 2021. My name is the Big Daddy D, David Mabley, and all my sink plungers seem to have gone missing. And I am Luke Murphy, and I seem to have run out of mercury. And as a result of the ongoing situation and with the UK being in the middle of another lockdown, uh, we are once again coming to you from our separate dwellings to talk about some classic Doctor Who. This time we're heading over to the 1960s, a period of history where the television series was still very popular and William Hartnell was still a number of years off from needing to regenerate. But today we are not here to talk about William Hartnell's incarnation of our beloved Time Lord. Well... Not yet, anyway. Um, this time we want to talk about a Doctor that broke all kinds of Doctor Who rules. First of all, he's human. He invented the TARDIS rather than steal it. And perhaps most staggeringly of all, his name actually is Doctor Who. However, all of this pales into comparison with the fact that we have a legend like Peter Cushing in the role. Most exciting. Welcome to We Need to Talk About Dot Dot Dot. Doctor Who and the Daleks, the Peter Cushing movie. believe that the only time that the Doctor has been in a movie would be the 1996 television film starring Paul McGann as the titular Time Lord. However, they would be mistaken. Just over three decades before that, Doctor Who and the Daleks came to the silver screen in June 1965, and as we mentioned just before those rather funky opening credits, there were quite a few differences between the television version of the Doctor and this film version. To answer some of that ambiguity, the Doctor has been human at least twice. Well, he was half human in the began movie, something that has never been addressed since then, so I guess that was ignored. The series of New Adventures, uh, Doctor Who books from Virgin Publishing, also had the Doctor as having human qualities in its canon, and there has been some ambiguity over whether the Doctor actually stole or invented the TARDIS. But, once again, I feel that we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Don't we always? So, before we talk about these films properly, we have to mention the studio that made them. Amicus. If you mention British-made horror movies, you immediately think of Hammer Films. And if you look at Hammer's output during the 1950s, 60s and 70s, there's not a lot of people that can argue about that. You could also argue that Hammer is the most successful British film studio ever. They may not have had the critical successes of Ely or Woodward Films, but from a purely commercial point of view, there are very, very few studios, if any, that can challenge Hammer at consistently making profitable films. Hammer did have some competition in the horror film market, mainly from Amicus Productions. The remarkable thing about Amicus is that they had no money and no actual studio. But between the years 1962 and 1978, they managed to produce 28 films in total, all turning in a rather decent profit. Started by Milton Sabotsky and Max J. Rosenberg, Amicus, a studio without walls, uh, made use of the ED levy. Now, this was a way for British filmmakers to receive a subsidy from the UK government to help with the production of films, as long as a minimum of 85% of the film uh, was shot in the United Kingdom or the Commonwealth, and only three non-British individual salaries could be excluded from the costs of the actual film, so ensuring the employment of British actors, technicians and film crew. So from private investment, money from the ED levy, and as low a budget that was practically possible, Sabotsky and Rosenberg hit upon an idea that Hammer hadn't done. 
portmanteau films. Portmanteau is a subgenre of movies consisting of several different short films, often tied together by a single theme, premise, or brief interlocking event, often a turning point. Taking inspiration from Alien's Dead of Night from 1945, Amicus's first film in the genre was Dr. Terror's House of Horrors in 1965, when a mysterious stranger gave tarot readings to other passengers on the same train journey all showing them where, when, and why they were about to die. So Amicus had further successes in this genre uh, over the years with The Torture Garden, uh, The House That Dripped Blood, uh, Asylum, Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, and From Beyond the Grave. Now, all of these followed the same formula, and in the case of Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror, all of the stories used in those films were adaptations of EC comic stories from the publication, uh, publications of the same name. And as comic book adaptations, they work really, really, really well. Now, very, very quickly, um, before we go on with Doctor Who, we'll talk a little bit about EC Comics. Um, EC Comics um, was a comics company here in America. Uh, they were very, very commercially successful um, in the 1950s because they were basically churning out um, horror comics, but also crime comics and, and, and other, other things as well, so westerns, romance, etc, etc. The really, really, really successful ones were the horror comics, like Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror. Now, interestingly enough, these were always um, kind of like introduced. There was a framing, uh, a framing sequence that where the, the Crypt Keeper uh, from Tales from the Crypt would introduce the story, then there would be the story itself, the end of the story there would be some sort of twist ending there would be a moral to it as well you know um, and then the crypt keeper would then sort of close the comic now at the time as i said these were really really big sellers they were out selling anything that national publications what is now dc uh, and timely uh, what is now marvel although I'm not entirely sure whether or not they were called timely at the time, um, were putting out. The issue is that at the height of, sort of McCarthyism in, uh, in the States, um, a, uh, a, a rather misguided gentleman called Dr. Frederick Wortham, who wasn't actually a doctor, um, wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent. And basically, in this book, he said that the main course for juvenile delinquency uh, in America was all down to comic books and EC Comics and particularly its publisher Bill Gaines was public enemy number one. The actual sort of hearing by all the senators and what have you actually cleared comic books. They said oh well we're not going to do anything D don't be silly Mr. Uh, Mr. Wertham because he was a mister he was not a doctor. Um, but the comics companies got together and said right to stop us from being targeted like this again, we're going to have a voluntary code that we're going to follow. And the comics code was formed. However, the knock-on effect of this was that Bill Gaines couldn't publish the same types of stories in Vault of Horror and Tales from the Crypts and you know, the crime comics and the, horror, you know, the science fiction comics and what have you. So he effectively put him out of business. Great shame. The stories are brilliant, really. For 1950s, the, the stories are superb. They're really, really well written. They're wonderfully drawn. Um, go and try and check some of these out. And it's it's these some of these stories that Amicus got hold of and did um, adaptations of. Some of the very, very first comic book adaptations in films. It's not bad going. Amicus did not solely concentrate on horror. Its first few films produced under the Amicus banner were made to capitalise on the emerging teen market, and their musicals 
It's Trad Dad in 1962, and It's Just for Fun in 1963 are about as awful as the titles make them out to be. Although, there are some unlikely gems um, in the list of Amicus productions. The Birthday Party, for example. That's an adaptation of a Harold, Harold Pinter play. Actually, a screenplay done by Pinter himself and directed by, uh, by uh, William Friedkin. Yes, that William Friedkin of the Exorcist fame and the French Connection. By the late 1970s, Amicus was finally closing down, with its last few films being adaptations of Edgar Rice Burroughs stories, such as At the Earth's Core, The Land That Time Forgot, and its follow-up, The People That Time Forgot. After Amicus closed its non-existent doors, uh, Sabotsky relocated to Canada for a time and unsuccessfully tried to carry on uh, the anthology tradition with such films as The Uncanny uh, in 1977 and The Monster Club in 1980. Um, Peter Cushing came along for the ride um, for the former, but he passed on the latter. He managed to secure the rights to some of Stephen King's properties in the 1980s and got a credit on the King anthology Cat's Eye in 1985. His final credits, again based on Stephen King films, would be The Lawnmower Man in 1992, Sometimes They Come Back in 1991, and its sequel, Sometimes They Come Back Again in 1996. He passed away in 1991. However, we're not going to talk about any of these portmanteau films here today. Oh no, we're not talking about Doug McClure, are we? No, no, mate, um, I wouldn't do that to you, although one day I will get you back for making me watch all of those Godfrey Hall ninja movies. Hmm, well, I won't mind talking about Doug McClure, just as long as we also get to talk about Dana Gillespie. <laughs> um, no, 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 stop it. Stop it right now. <clears throat> Moving on. Although I'm sure we will look at some of these films from Amicus in a future episode of the show, today we are going to be looking at something else that the small studio produced, because... As luck would have it, Amicus was the studio that made the two Doctor Who and the Dalek movies in the 1960s. Hello there. Hang on, what happened to John? New Year, new Doctor. Anyway, that was a brief history of Amicus. Because meanwhile, over at the BBC, a new television programme was about to begin airing its very first episode. The first episode of what would become the longest-running science fiction television programme of all time. It was the 23rd of November, 1963, by 15pm, just after Grandstand, and families over the country were settling down to their tea. The previous day, the world had been rocked from the shocking news that President John F. Kennedy had been shot and killed. So the new television programme that was about to be transmitted that promised to take its audience on adventure in time and space sounded like just the sort of harmless escapism that was needed at the time. Little did anyone know that this seemingly harmless television programme would still be going to this very day. The premise of the programme was simple. The main character, known only as the Doctor, along with his granddaughter Susan and two of Susan's school teachers, Ian and Barbara, who are basically kidnapped, travel through time and space in a time machine called the TARDIS which always looks like a police telephone box no matter where they go. The Doctor never did get around to fixing the chameleon circuit. Well, not long term anyway. Originally planned as family tea time viewing, the programme would have been used to educate the audience by using time travel to explore famous historical events and scientific theories. This would explain why Ian, a science teacher, and Barbara, a history teacher, had been brought along for the ride. Sid Newman, the then head of drama at the BBC and the person responsible for initially developing the programme, told his staff that although this was a science fiction programme, there, were to be under, there was to be under no circumstances any BEMs or bug-eyed monsters. And his staff stuck to this rule for all of four weeks. The very first Doctor Who serial, which these days is referred to as An Unearthly Child, took the TARDIS crew to the Stone Age, where they found themselves caught between warring Stone Age tribes who demanded to know the secret of fire. It's not a bad first story to help you get into Doctor Who, although you might be surprised that the Doctor's not quite the heroic figure that you'd imagine him to be. 
Not only has he essentially kidnapped two people and taken them away with him, but at one point he clearly intends to smash an injured caveman's head in with a rock. Let go of me! What are you doing? Well, uh, I, I, I was going to get him to draw our way back to the TARDIS. For his second story, broadcast over seven weeks, from December 1963 to February 1964, the TARDIS crew were flung into the far future and landed on a planet ravaged by nuclear war where the only survivors were the peaceful Thals and another race. The Daleks. The only interest we have in the Thals is their total extermination. Ironically enough, it would be the Daleks that actually saved Doctor Who. The BBC were already started to get cold feet over the new programme during that first serial, and were preparing to pull the plug on the entire show. Shooting the prehistoric storyline had been costly, and the audience's reception had been, mm, lukewarm at best. The decision was made that the show would be cancelled after its original commissioned run of 13 episodes. But then, something changed. Terry Nation was commissioned to write the scripts for this futuristic serial, during which he came up with the idea of the Daleks. And I suppose you could say at this point, the rest was history. The adventure would end up not only saving the show from a premature uh, cancellation, but would also ensure that the show stayed on the air for far, far longer than anyone could have possibly predicted. Newman, at first, hated the idea of the Daleks. It went against everything that he wanted to set up, i.e. no bug-eyed monsters. However, he would later change his tune when he read about the audience reaction. Well, that and the potential for merchandising revenue. But before that, he would need some convincing to go ahead with the story. In what would be a very progressive move at the time, Verity Lambert, at the age of 28, was the youngest and the only female producer at the BBC. And even though she was thankful to Newman for giving her the job when no one else would have given her a chance, she wasn't afraid to tell him when he was wrong, and she went ahead with the originally planned design for the Daleks. And you know what? It's just as well that she did, because otherwise we might have been deprived of a cultural icon that sent waves of children hiding behind the settee for years to come. Mark Gattis's superb 2013 film, An Adventure in Space and Time, is a great insight into the struggle to get the programme approved and on the air, and some of the behind-the-scenes drama that went on. The show would become a huge success for the BBC, with the Daleks themselves proving to be very, very popular villains. So much so that the idea was hatched to take the Time Lord to the big screen. So, at this point, Sapotsky and Rosenberg von Amicus stepped in to purchase the rights to three films based on Doctor Who serials from Terry Nation and the BBC. Uh, for the princely sum of £500, which roughly is around about £10,000 in today's money. The first of these was released in 1965 and was an adaptation of the very first Dalek serial. The movie version had a budget of around about £180,000, about £3.5 million in today's money. Um, which the film made back and more besides. In fact, it was the 20th highest grossing film in Britain that year. The main plot is essentially the same as the very first Dalek story, except some of the characters have been changed significantly. Instead of William Hartnell as the mysterious Time Lord, we instead have Peter Cushing as Doctor Who, an eccentric human inventor who presumably has a first name although we never find out what it is. The TARDIS, or rather just TARDIS in small letters, is literally something that Doctor Who has built up in his garden. It's not a word made up of time in relative dimensions and space, and the way it is bigger on the inside than it is on the, uh, on the outside, it's just the way it's been built. There's no mention of transcendental dimensions. What does that mean? Well, Transcendental Dimensions? Yeah. Well, it means it's bigger on the inside than out. But why is the TARDIS bigger on the inside than out? Because it's dimensionally transcendental. Um, fair enough. Whilst most grandfathers would probably have um, a garden or, or an allotment to tend to in their retirement, this gentleman is building a time machine that just so happens to look like a police box. Unlike the serial, there is no mention as to why the machine has this appearance. 
Well, everybody needs a hobby, I suppose. I mean, it could have been worse. He could have been writing erotic literature in his garden shed like a certain Mr. Rocky Flintstone did. Uh, yeah, moving swiftly on. <laughs> the Doctor is joined by his two granddaughters, Barbara and Susan, played in the film version by Jenny Linden and Roberto Tovey. Now, Tovey is brilliant as the Doctor's young granddaughter, and there is a lot of lovely moments between Susan and the Doctor that really makes you believe that there is, uh, you know, that they are genuinely uh, grandfather and granddaughter going off on, a, on an adventure together. No life, no movement. Can you see anyone? No. Let's investigate. Oh, yes, let's. <laughs> uh, Tovey was 11 years old at the time um, the film was produced, so as an incentive, she was told by the film's director, Gordon Fleming, that every time she managed to deliver her lines right on the first take, that he would pay her a shilling, about five pence in modern money. She made so much money that Fleming didn't repeat the same deal in the sequel. Um, the film version of Susan is both younger uh, and probably more capable of dealing with sort of dangerous situations than what a teenage television counterpart was. Um, the TV version of, Su of Susan was often prone to hysterical fits and was scared of, well, pretty much everything. The original TV version of Susan was also one of those annoying female characters that basically couldn't like take one step or two without getting into trouble. Um, one of those characters that always managed to sprain their ankle from tripping over their own feet and thankfully we don't see those type of characters anymore. Uh, perhaps showing that some things never change, Susan even managed to fall over and sprain her ankle for absolutely no reason at all in the 20th anniversary story The Five Doctors, where an older Susan was reunited with the first Doctor. Barbara is now related to the Doctor, and she doesn't appear to be a teacher um, in this, um, but she's certainly no damsel in distress, and she helps the TARDIS crew escape danger on more than one occasion. Ian isn't a teacher either, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, and in this story he's Barbara's clumsy new boyfriend, although it was often hinted in the television series that there might be some sort of romance between Ian and Barbara. Um, it wouldn't be until after they stopped travelling with the Doctor that they actually did become a couple. This couple in Cambridge, both professors, Ian and Barbara Chesterton. Rumour has it, they've never aged. Not since the 60s. I wonder. The film version of Ian is played by none other than Roy Castle, who we've seen previously on the show in Carry On Up the Kyber. Castle does get to use his comedy chops in this film as well. Um, whilst the television version of Ian was very much the hero with all the bravery and the morals, in this film he is the comic relief. If there is something to fall over or to fall into, or a box of soft-scented chocolates to accidentally sit in, then Ian is going to be the one to do it. In fact, it's him leaning on the comically large lever that sends the TARDIS crew off on their adventure to begin with. In a way, this is more sort of Ian's story than it is the Doctor's. He grows as a character and eventually becomes the hero that his television counterpart was. He even goes as far as stopping the Daleks' countdown before their nuclear bomb goes off. Stop the countdown! The bomb will destroy the planet! Daleks! So apart from the change to the characters, the plot is the same. The TARDIS travels to the planet Scaro, where they discover that the land is completely dead, ravaged by years of war between the two most dominant races on the planet, both of whom have been altered by the actions of their ancestors. Like in the television version, the Doctor advises his fellow travellers that the TARDIS has run out of mercury and will require more if they are to make the return trip back home. However, just like in the serial, it turns out that this was a blatant lie and the Doctor was just using this as an excuse to explore the futuristic city where the Daleks live. From there, just like the TV version, our heroes are captured and held prisoner by the Daleks, uh, but manage to escape when Ian hides inside a Dalek's metal casing. They meet up with the Thals, who all look like Ziggy Stardust in the film version for some reason, and then they all sneak back into the city they literally just escaped from in order to stop the Daleks from setting off another nuclear bomb which would leave them as the only life form on the planet left. 
during the original serial, the pacing of the story did slow down quite a bit during sort of rather drawn out excursions through the caves. Um, in fact, it was so drawn out that it almost uh, made us want to see and told us plunge into darkness long before it actually happened. Um, as it was telegraphed um, from very, very early on that he wouldn't be around to see the end credits. The same thing really happens with the film version as well, although we do get the sight of him getting punched so hard by his brother that it causes a caving, and although Antodus does make the same sacrifice in order to save Ian, the moment isn't anywhere near as tragic as it turns out it wasn't really such a large drop after all. Oh. He's all right. Oh, what a relief. Although I suppose that's what happens when you have what is essentially uh, an abridged version of the television serial. Whilst the original television version was a seven-parter that went on for about three hours in total and was rather slowly paced, this film version moves along at a rather brisk pace and is only 80 minutes long, which is barely even feature film length. Another difference in the film version is that the Daleks now have a smoke weapon rather than firing what we we'll presume to be a laser uh, in the television show. I say presumed because whatever the Daleks fired from their gunsticks resulted in the colours on screen becoming um, inverted for a few seconds. It wouldn't actually become a visible death ray uh, until the Tom Baker story Genesis of the Daleks. Hello there! Yes, we'll get to you eventually, Tom. Um, for the cinematic debut, it was originally planned that the film version of the Daleks' weapon would actually be a flamethrower. Uh, but it was decided that that would be far too scary for a young audience, um, and not to mention a huge health and safety risk uh, on set. There is one moment where a Dalek has essentially a welding torch uh, to cut into a room that uh, our heroes are hiding in, uh, but other than that, the evil Pepper Pops are essentially moving fire extinguishers, uh, although we would later see the flamethrower equipped uh, Daleks in a TV serial, uh, The Daleks' Master Plan. Of course, by far the most noticeable difference between the film and the television versions is that this is the very first time we would see a Doctor Who adventure in stunning Technicolor. The television version wouldn't get onto colour until John Pertwee began his run as the Doctor in 1970. But here, five years earlier, Doctor Who is breaking away from the restrictions of being on that tiny black and white telly in your living room. And now you can see them in colour on the big screen. Now you can see them in colour on the big screen. Yes, I just said that. <clears throat> anyway, this isn't the only upgrade that the Daleks have had since the television version. As you can see, they now come in a variety of different colours and flavours. Something that was adopted by Stephen Moffat when he took over as producer with Matt Smith's time on the show. The Daleks in this film also have specialised roles. Um, again, something that would carry through into the TV series. The Moffat versions had titles like Drone or Scientist Supreme. Um, it's not hard to imagine that the movie versions of the Daleks were possibly organised in this way. Uh, some of the Daleks in the film um, have had their plunger <laughs> arm replaced with a claw. And again, there's examples of this in the TV show post the release of this film. Uh, of course, the most awesome version of a Dalek um, has to be the special weapons uh, Dalek from Remembrance of the Daleks in 1988. Um, the Dalek ha this Dalek had no plunger, but just one massive gun. Um, yes, he's uh, clearly compensating for something. Yes, that's quite enough of that, thank you. So, it's Doctor Who, but with a bigger budget, more impressive sets, better camera work, improved special effects, and it's in colour. I mean, this must have been absolutely mind-blowing for fans of the television show when it first arrived in cinemas back in 1965. Critically, however, the film got an absolute mauling. Um, Halliwell's Film Guide describes the film as uh, limply put together, uh, whilst The Guardian described Roy Castle's performance as, to call it hammy would be a disservice to pigs. But despite this, uh, the film did well enough at the box office for Amicus to greenlight 
the adaptation of the second Dalek serial that started on television in November of 1964, the Dalek Invasion of Earth. This time, with a bigger budget to play with, the evil silver pepper pots were not on their home planet of Scarrow, but on the very streets of London itself. But we'll save that for another episode. I thoroughly enjoyed Doctor Who and the Daleks. It's a fantastic, family-friendly, rainy Sunday afternoon sci-fi that you can stick on and the whole family can watch. Um, in many ways, it is superior to the television version. I mean, you're not having to sit through um, a three-hour uh, black and white series. You've got a very short and quick um, abridged version, all in colour. Um, not to be sort of disrespectful to the uh, William Hartnell era, but a lot of the Doctor Who stories are a bit sort of heavy going and take a lot to, to, to sort of get through them. They weren't exactly designed to be binge watched. Um, there are some absolute crackers in there. I mean, the, 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 the Dalek story, the first two Dalek stories in particular, uh, are two of them. But to be able to see them like this would have taken that story and condensed it and abridged it and put it into something that's much more quicker paced. Um, much more sort of family friendly, not quite as dark, not quite as bleak. Um, I think it's a fantastic film. I think it's uh, it's, it's an odd curiosity in the uh, in the Doctor Who canon, and that's something that we will address in the next episode. But you know what? I really enjoyed this, and uh, you know I can sort of watch this on BritBox, which is what's played on in the background at the moment, and they've recently had the Blu-ray treatment as well. So uh, if you've not have had a chance to watch the uh, Peter Cushing Doctor Who movies, then by all means, give them a go. So, um, please uh, be sure to come back uh, to the channel again soon for our next episode, which we will be, uh, we need to talk about Daleks, Invasion Earth, 2150 AD. In the meantime, please leave a like and a comment. Uh, share this video with your friends across all your various social media platforms, in particular with fans of Doctor Who and classic sci-fi in general. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and ring the bell to be notified of new videos. But until next time, I am the Big Daddy D, David Mabley. And I am forever Luke Murphy. And we'll catch you again for another episode of We Need to Talk About... Dot, dot, dot.